how happy I am to be in your presence this morning. I do not claim to be an authority on the subject that I've been requested to speak on and about, but I have thoughts to share with you, which thoughts I believe will be cross-fertilized by the thoughts of others during the panel discussion. But let me say at the very outset that the question of the commercialization of politics is one that is evergreen, particularly since the advent of multi-party politics in Africa. If you allow me a little latitude, prior to the re-emergence of multi-party politics in 1989, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, which was the landmark historical event, we sometimes forget that many African countries did actually have many political parties at the advent of our regaining independence. And I use the word regaining our independence deliberately because sometimes we behave as if we were not independent at all and that we acquired our independence through the process of decolonization. The truth as we know it, prior to the advent of the European powers in the 18th and 19th centuries, Africa and Africans were independent. And then very harshly, courtesy of the history that we are all aware about, the European powers congregated in Berlin in 1884 and arbitrarily and harshly created different countries which we now claim to be citizens of. I was listening to a speech yesterday where somebody was saying rather melodramatically that a day before the conference in Berlin, Two couples sleeping on one bed woke, the following, woke up the following day only to discover that the husband was a Ugandan and the wife was a Kenyan. The whole idea of that dramatization was to demonstrate how arbitrary the process of the partition of Africa was. We also know, and one need not belabor the issue, that no sooner had the process of colonization started than Africans started agitating for independence. And the struggle for independence was attended by violence in a number of African countries, and ultimately we regained our independence. On the eastern coasts of Africa, you will remember that there were efforts even in those early days, particularly through Tanzania's Julius Kambarage Nyerere, to delay Tanzania's independence so that Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, or Tanganyika as it was then, could regain independence as one country. But the leaders of Kenya, being Jomo Kenyatta, and your own Apollo Milton Obote thought otherwise. The net effect is that we regained our independence as separate African countries, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. And you will remember that there, were multi -part, there was multi-party politics. And it's also instructive in those early days, whether we want to deny it or not, that those who are in the forefront of the struggle for independence at that time, notwithstanding that they committed certain mistakes thereafter, were animated by the desire 
to restore the dignity of the people. And one can argue here in Uganda, for example, that UPC or DP, which were the main political parties at that time, did represent certain clear ideological orientations. One can also say that in Kenya at that time, the Kenya African National Union and the Kenya Democratic Union did represent some clear ideological orientation. And I'm not using the word ideology in the classical sense to mean Marxism or Leninism or those other isms. I'm talking about using ideology loosely to refer to clarity on what independence meant and would mean for the people. That was also true in Tanzania through then Tanganyika African National Union. One can therefore say that in those early days, the leaders were animated by the desire to move their countries in the right direction and to restore the people's dignity. One need only look at the very casual works of some of the leaders at that time across the continent of Africa. Whether you are looking at the casual or the more serious works of Julius Nyerere, or looking and reading the more casual works of people like Amilka Cabral in Guinea-Bissau, or you are reading the more casual works of Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, or the more casual works of Kwame Nkrumah, and I'm using casual rather than serious to demonstrate that even when they were casual, they were committed to certain ideals, and that these ideals had one aim. So that when the leaders met in the month of May in 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and one need only read the 32 speeches that were delivered by the 32 delegations led by either heads of states or heads of government or their representatives and the national movement, then to realize that there was clarity in the minds of Africans of the day. But there is one speech that stood out on that day, the speech of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah. He was as animated, as agitated as he ought to have been in exhorting the leaders of the day that the safety of the African continent not only required but demanded on that day that Africa should move towards unity. And he reminded the people that the colonial project was still alive and well and that it would come camouflaged as neo-colonialism. And he reminded the leaders that if they did not unite, the erstwhile colonial powers would come in a different way. Whether those colonial powers were France, or the United Kingdom, or Belgium, or Spain, or Portugal, they would come. Kwame Nkrumah may not have been a prophet, but his words were prophetic. Kwame Nkrumah may not have had the foresight of a Jewish prophet, but when one looks at Africa today, one can see very clearly that the neo-colonial project is alive and well, despite our protestation to the contrary. If you go to the, the so-called Francophone, and let me pause for a moment and remind us that we are the only continent in the world which Western Europe, and when I talk about Western Europe, I'm talking about the conceptual West. The conceptual West extends beyond the continent of Europe, refers to us as Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, Lusophone Africa. So Uganda is Anglophone. Notwithstanding that not more than 30% speak English, you are Anglophone. In Cote d'Ivoire, Cote d'Ivoire is Francophone. Notwithstanding that not more than 30% can speak French. Nigeria is Anglophone. Notwithstanding that there are over 500 local languages, Nigeria is Anglophone. 
Angola is Lusophone and so is Mozambique. That is where we find ourselves. One may ask, what has that to do with the subject that I've been invited to speak about, the commercialization of politics? It has everything to do with it. 